that we're not as late as we usually are. So I won't waste any more time except to say that our next guest, our final guest, she's very welcome. We've tried before to get her more than twice. Uh, she's one of our local politicians. There's four in this constituency. We've had three others, so this is the fourth. But she wasn't necessarily the fourth because we tried to get her for the second and the third. But I think COVID uh, ruled that out. And I've come to the conclusion that it would have been easier to get Madonna. <laughs> but anyway, would you please put your hands together for Joan Collins, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, is that the right height for you? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, so welcome. Grand, Thank it's you. great to finally meet you and have you here. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, I might as well get straight into it. Former Socialist Party member, formerly People Before Profit Alliance, former Independent, former Independence for Change. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, is there a pattern there? I was trying to find a home. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I was originally in the Labour Party, Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, then I joined the militant who would have been a sort of socialist grouping within the Labour Party. Then I was expelled from the Labour Party. Um, and then my, I got completely involved in the militant then. And then, uh, yeah, we had what I would have viewed it was a bit real potential um, from the point of view of building the left in this country would have been the uh, uh, United Left Alliance in 2011. When we stood, um, did, I meet, did I meet them ever? Yeah, well? you did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Honestly, it's very hard to get good research. Yeah, <laughs> um, the United Left Alliance now was a, um, a, it was a question that you asked me in the email about why don't we all get together? We did all get together, um, but unfortunately, within about a year and a half, um, it just fell apart. Because that's really where I wanted to go with the questioning. When I look at the right, all the nice boys in suits, mm -hmm. like Leo and, 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 and Simon, any, any, lots of Simons, and uh, Michal and all that, they're all looking for, re actually, I was going to say, they're all looking for reasons to get into bed together, but let's just leave the video out of it. <laughs> um, they're all looking for reasons to come together on yeah. the right side, and yet over on the left side, they can't stop looking for reasons to not get together. They're all trying to be holier than thou and all that. So you ended up with this very, very fragmented picture on the left. And meanwhile, the folks over on the right are kind of going, Grant, sure, if these lads don't want to get into power, should we just take power? Yeah, that's the unfortunate thing that happened out of that. Um, but the, where I am at the moment with the right to change, and that came from the, uh, the right to water campaign, community activists who got very involved actively in that, didn't want to just go back into their homes and not be active. So we, we have that set up now at the moment. But listen, um, <laughs> they, they do say that the left will just fall apart. Um, uh, they find an argument. Uh, our one, one group thinks they're more um, knowledgeable or have the right answers for everything. Um, but yeah, I, I was really disappointed that the United Left Alliance didn't develop because I think we would have filled that vacuum that was there that Sinn Féin has sort of moved into um, at the moment. So yeah, I think it was... A, but what could you have done that was so bad that caused you to be expelled from the Labour Party? And indeed, when you're with people before profit, like, what could have been so atrocious about the other members that you had to leave? Like, what, what is the big falling out over? Um, well, in the Labour Party, it was because I wrote in the, the militant new, newspaper um, that we, we would have sold, um, and I challenged uh, the Labour Party some of the, uh, um, some of the policies they had. Um, and about myself and Claire Daly was expelled at that time as well, um, along with myself. Um, Ruth Coppinger was expelled at the time along with myself. <laughs> um, and I think Mick Barry was as well. Um, yeah, so we were brought in front of the conference and we were expelled from the party. And what was it you did wrong? We wrote, I wrote an article in the Middleton newspaper challenging the, uh, the policies of the, the, the Labour Party at the time. So they weren't left wing enough? Would, would well, no, it? it was part. Uh, no, no, <laughs> they weren't left wing enough. No, but um, there was a move to the right at the time. Dick Spring was um, the leader, and um, so we were challenged the whole question of um, their their policies in relation to where they were going in the future. You know, so yeah, that's essentially I was expelled at the conference. 
and because you know, I think this is your third time as a TD, third term, Th yeah, right? It is. And obviously, all of that time you've been in opposition, yeah. And I know you can do a lot of work, and I know you do a lot of work, but it's very difficult to get anything achieved in opposition. You, you, it's very hard to get your own uh, policies implemented. Mm -hmm. You're always going to be on the other side, kind of going, you're not good enough, you're not good enough, but those people are the ones who make the decisions. And I just wonder, is it, is it worthwhile to be in opposition all this time? Or is there a moment where you have to say, look, I'm going to park my principles in order to get in and get, even if I get a quarter of my principles implemented, isn't it better off than getting nothing implemented? You, you, can do, you can do things in opposition. I mean, <laughs> the water charges campaign uh, pushed the government right back in relation to bringing in water charges, the huge movement that developed out of that, and being part of that, um, and we were able to bring that into the Doyle and challenge uh, Fine Gael and the Labour Party at the time. Um, so you can do things, and um, you can push the government to um, bring in, sort of change their position in legislation. Um, but uh, from the point of view of policy, I mean, I've, the after the last election in 2020, we did go in and, and sit down with Sinn Féin and discuss out the, the policies that, that we could probably work on together. And um, so, yeah, I, I certainly... How, how did that go? Well, we couldn't... <laughs> Sinn Féin couldn't form a government because we hadn't got enough um, uh, on the, the left to form that government. Or, I mean, there was enough numbers there, except not everybody was left wing. I mean, they could have kind of, you could have cut a deal with some of the more centralist people or some of the independents. They still hadn't got the numbers. If everybody ganged up in Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil, you had the numbers. <laughs> it, would have, it would have meant the Greens as well. But know? the Labour Party would have been, yeah. And the Labour Party. Yeah, yeah. but the Labour Party weren't interested in discussing at the time, yeah. so. Yeah, I, I, I just, I... It's a mindset. I mean, even the fact that the Labour Party wouldn't go into government was... was, was uh, I, and I know what, what, what probably happened is that smaller parties go into government to get their asses kicked, and then they go, geez, they're not going to do that for a long time again. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I remember somebody saying to me one time, the worst day in opposition... I say, the, best, the worst day in, in government is better than the best day in opposition. opposition. And, and it, it just strikes me again that, once again, the left-wing mentality is about throwing rocks at the people who are in government as opposed to being in government and making decisions and getting stuff implemented. Now, well, if I saw um, a, a progressive party in, in, in the majority, I would certainly talk to them. But um, who, who do you talk to except for the next election? Might, it probably would be Sinn Féin, um, would be the, the uh, majority party. Um, the fact that Sinn Féin is probably would stand two, at least two candidates here, three candidates, and um, could squeeze out the very people that they want to go into, they say they want to go into coalition with, and then they're going to have to look at maybe Fianna Fáil or on, on that line to sort of go form a coalition. That's an interesting one. So we did have Angus Osnodic here. Mm. It's probably a year ago at this stage. Angus had two quotas in the last election. That's right. So in other words, Sinn Féin had, had one second candidate that two of them would have come in first, mm -hmm. you know, or at least in the top three, yep. I'd say, you know. And um, so what's interesting, what you're saying is that they're, they, they're, they're, they'll definitely run two candidates, if not even three, mm -hmm. in the next election in this constituency. Rather than squeezing out, or and that would be right across the country, so rather than squeezing out or hurting the Fine Gael, Fianna Fáil people, it'll end up squeezing out the other like-minded candidates from their constituencies, people like yourself. Potentially, potentially, yeah, yeah, potentially. Like you'll be running in the next election, would you? Yes, yeah. And would you fear for your seat for, from the strength of Sinn Féin? Potentially, you, you never know when you stand in the election whether you're going to get elected or not. Um, so, yeah, it would be a struggle, certainly a struggle. It's a good time to ask you to, to, to address the audience and uh, say why they should vote for you in the next election. <laughs> Thank you very much, We'll give you 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> why you should vote for me? Um, I've always stood with the people in the community. Every step along the way since 2004 with the anti bin charges campaign, and I will always keep doing that. And I always believe that we, you need a strong opposition to be able to take on the government and work with the people in the community. Simple as that. Solidarity. Okay. And in terms of local issues here in the Dublin 8 area, Dublin 10, Dublin 12, 
what, what do you see as being the issues that people should be conscious of and that you feel that you can help with? Well, the issues we were just talking about earlier on, the linear park over there, this, um, that's going on at the moment, um, and there's a lot of issues around that. Um, there's, there's obviously a lot of people are involved with cleanups and the cl climate issues. Um, um, yeah, there's not really a huge amount in, in, in a sort of a national sense or a general sense that's going on. It's mainly smaller things that we, we're involved in. And we're very much involved, obviously, now with the housing crisis, trying to assist people um, that, that come into the office. And you know the office is open on Sundrive Road and um, just there up from Sundrive Road and, and Old County Road. Um, and near, near the Garda station. Yeah, yeah, yeah just across the road. Um, and uh, it's, it's open there five days a week, so if anybody ever wants to call into it, that's why we opened it up there in 2011. Um, for to support people individually or generally on issues um, from that point of view, yeah. Now, I know that if I say to you, well, if you're in government, what would you do? And, and you're about to say, well, we'd tackle the housing crisis and we'd tackle the cost of living. And I don't know, there's probably one or two other things like that, right? And everybody wants to do that. It's not as if there's any party in there that's against housing or against um, cheaper prices or cheaper cost of living. Um, but, but what determines the success or otherwise of a government isn't so much the policies going into government, it's the state of the economy once they're in there. What is it that you can do, if you were in government in the year's time or two years time, what is it that you can do about housing or the cost of living or other uh, issues like that, that the, the boys and girls in Fine Gael and Fine Fáil can't do? Well, what they haven't done is uh, use public land to build uh, public housing and cost of living, or cost of, uh, um, cost of living here. <laughs> uh, what's the, co the cost rental um, model um, of building? And affordable homes, they haven't done that. So what I would I would support other opposition people in saying that uh, we need a, a state-run building company, run by the state, to get the public land. We know there's enough public land out there that can build the housing we need, um, and that's what we would do. Um, and and build, uh, start building houses. We were building houses in the 40s and 50s, and we hadn't got any money. Um, but the, the, the tact of the government to date has been to depend on the private sector, who have failed, failed miserably in, in, uh, in, in, in building what we need. Um, and in relation to cost of living, what I argued at the very beginning was that we should put a cap on the energy prices. They've done that in France, um, and then renationalised their uh, fossil fuel companies. Um, and they've kept the level of inflation below 6%. But at least it, gives, it has given certainty to industry and to people that the prices won't keep going up, which, which we've seen a certain amount of over here, the price gouging, and because they can use it, the argument that inflation is just pushing up their prices. We heard today that milk has gone up nearly um, 23%, sugar has gone up nearly 25%, um, so it just gives all that, that, that excuse for manufacturing to keep pushing the prices up. I'm going to throw it open to the floor here. Is there anybody who would like to ask a question with Joan? I've often wondered how politicians and activists like yourself, how do you stay motivated and, and energised year after year after year? You know, there's all the different problems. I, I, I repeat the question first. Yeah. She, um, she's wondering here, uh, she often wonders why, how politicians manage to stay motivated and energised. Well, I've been an activist all my life. I worked in the post office. I was a trade union rep um, since about 1980. And what motivates me is that we have to have a voice for people who haven't got a voice in the, in the Dáil and, and publicly because that, if, the, if the established parties are not challenged both, uh, both by voice, vocally and by actively, they just get away with murder. They get away with more murder than getting away with now. And so I think it's really, that, that, that's what motivates me, people motivating, people do. Um, one thing, right? Um, I came across you on the phone. You've never met me. I think it was about seven years ago. And my daughter had a lot of breast time. And the surgeon had cancer, and cancer, and cancer, and cancer. And she's on her adult surgeon. She was just changed her birthday. And I remember I was calling you, everyone going crazy. And I called you up and said, I didn't hear you. And I remember your response. It was the best response I ever had. 
Thank you. Okay. I'll just Thank repeat you. that as well this lady had her child had a problem with, with the wrist and they're getting difficulty after difficulty after difficulty. Yeah. Yeah. And then the only, the only the best response. Yeah. I will not mention it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Sh share it out good and loud. What do you mean by public land? What do you mean by public land? Land owned by the state. So like where You'd be talking about um, um, in, in Dublin, there's loads of OPW sites. There's a, a big site at the back of where I live in Ring Street near Chicor. There's loads of those plots of land all around Dublin and the, and the nat nationwide that, that can be used for, for housing. Yeah. One more question and then I have a couple and then we we'll wrap up. Is there anybody else, Michael? I'm just interested, Joan, in the Children's Hospital, which is in our constituency here. How would the left have approached the development of that differently from what we see today? Uh, melting bills. And uh, the second part is when it is finished, the congestion that we see here in Rialto and in the South Circular Road, how is the, uh, act, uh, the emergency vehicles? I'm flabbergasted like that there's no strategy. And I'm just wondering what your opinion on that. Well, I think Michael is it. Michael. Yeah, I, I, I think what I would do, I mean, if I was getting an extension in my house, I'd get the builder and we'd agree a price. Now, you'd have to factor in that there might be some inflation, but you agree a price. And this used to happen an awful lot on our national roads. Um, where the, the, the builders would go in um, and then they hike the price up and spend ages building them, you know, it'd be nearly five years building a, a road. But what the, the, the state did bring in then was that they, they looked for the price and they told them, if you don't do that within the, the agreed time of three years or whatever, um, you just won't get paid it. You won't get paid anymore. So it forced the developers to actually go in, the builders to go in, and, and build the road at the proper time with the proper amount of money. And that's what should be done with things like the National Hospital and any other um, national... Uh, we're going to have the same now with the National Maternity Hospital. Unfortunately, it's what, going to be at St. Vincent's, but that's uh, possibly the same thing will happen. If we don't have the proper tenders and the, and the proper agreed prices and, and agreed time to build, that's, to me, that's a no-brainer. And the second part, the congestion, that it, it, it looks to me like it's a hopeless situation because if, if, if there's a, people trying to get to this hospital, there doesn't seem to be a plan of action. Well, and there's no discussion about it. The, the hospital seems to think that they can manage it. Um, I remember we met the um, the senior uh, consultants and all that, um, and the p people running that the national hospital, uh, the, ch the children's hospital, and they were convinced that they could cater for that between the Lewis and, and I know people got have got conflicting ideas about the hospital and the, the congestion it's going to cause, um, but I, that's the, I, I haven't got an answer. No problem. <laughs> We're almost going to finish up. Before we do, you don't happen to have a, a book or a CD that you want to No, unfortunately. And I really, I was sitting there looking at the great talent up here <laughs> with all the CDs. I have cooked a few puddings. I should have brought them down. should have brought them in. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Can you think? Well, that's the next question. First of all, can I thank you for being here? I, I know it's a short interview, but thank you very much. Yeah, give a round of applause. And then I'll... I'll, I'll Because it being Christmas, I'd like to finish up the, song, the, 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 the night with Silent Night, Holy Night. And we're stuck for singers, aren't we? <laughs> uh, both myself and Joan are participants, not leaders, but I know we have good singers in the audience. Absolutely. I, I'd be delighted if you decided to come up and sing into the microphone, but if mm -hmm. not, if that's only embarrassing you, I just hope that you are vociferous in the, uh, as you're sitting down. But I've printed out the words. And I'm going to hand some over on this side. If you can maybe, I, there's not enough for everybody. Is there anybody else who'd like to come up to the microphone? Charlie, anybody? We'll sing out. We'll sing out. Okay.
I knew that you were going to share this, right? Okay. You want to come over to the mic? I would like to go to yours. Jeffrey? You and I are saying this mic. I'm not going to sing our name. It's all right. I'm going to together. Are we all set to go? Now, if you can hear our voices clearly, it means you're not loud enough. And if I see anybody not singing, we're going to put the cameras on them and the microphone on them, right? <laughs> so I want you to join in because neither of us, I'll be right in saying neither of us are really up for this. Are you ready? Okay. So happy Christmas, everybody. Thank you for coming to the show. I hope you have a wonderful time. It's been a very strange year. For us, I think it's been a better year from the COVID point of view, but of course, this is the year we'll always remember from the Ukraine point of view. So happy Christmas. Good night. Silent night. Okay. Silent night. Oh.